Run! Really? It's not safe out there. There's a saber-toothed tiger looking around. You better be careful. What are you doing? Don't peek. Okay, just one little peek. How's this possible, you ask? That's because you're in virtual reality, of course. These cool but very dangerous-looking big cats were alive during the last ice age. What if they decided to show up at your doorstep out of nowhere? Knock, knock! A saber-toothed tiger is waiting for you to buy its cookies. Meanwhile, the coelacanth, this massive-looking fish, comes from a lineage that's been around for over 300 million years. We thought they didn't exist anymore until 1938, that is, when a live coelacanth was found again. Since then, they've been roaming the waters of the east coast of Africa and the waters of Sulawesi, Indonesia. Man, I wouldn't want to go for a swim and meet one of these fellas face to face. Their jaw has an intracranial joint, which means their mouth opens up by a lot. This is so they can eat large prey, like me. Not good. They're huge, too. Imagine a fish that's as long as you're tall and weighing as much as an average human. The takahe, a flightless bird, was thought to be gone in the year 1898. They're very cute, small and multicolored, usually not taller than your knee. But picture this. You're out for a hike in the Murkison Mountains. Looking around, you spot the bird you thought was extinct. But there they are, as happy as ever, surviving and chilling. A whole colonies of takahes was indeed found just 50 years after they were pronounced extinct. Good job, tiny little birds! A singing dog. Ever heard of those? Riley does sing sometimes when he's bored or hungry, but these are real performers. New Guinea singing dogs. They've been only recently discovered again in the wild for the first time in 50 years. Still, they were never completely extinct to begin with. New Guineans made sure they were safe next to them. But in the wild? Very rare and hard to catch a sight of. Look, there goes one. The New Guinea singing dogs are called so because of their famous high-pitched singing. They sometimes sing together, too. A dog choir of sorts, where they all howl together. I bet they sing better than I do in the shower. Not going far from this area, we have bats. But these ones are sort of different. You see, their ears are enormous. I guess that's why they're called the New Guinea big-eared bats. Clever. The species was found again when one of them was accidentally caught in a bat trap. Until then, I guess they were playing hide-and-seek with us, because up till 1890, they had been thought to be gone. They're still not out of the danger zone because of habitat loss. Imagine you discover a fossil of a species you thought had been extinct for a long time. Yet two years later, a whole living group of said species is found. Well, this is exactly what happened in 1977 with the Mallorcan midwife toad. It's sort of brownish in color with darker brown that makes up its skin spots. Other than that, it's just a small toad with googly eyes. The group of live toads was found close to where the fossil was on the island of Mallorca. There aren't many of them left, about 500 in fact, and as of right now, they're declared vulnerable by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Now, are you a fan of tortoises? You will be when you take a look at this huge beauty. It's called the Ferdinanda Island Galapagos tortoise. It hasn't been seen since 1906, but on February 17, 2019, we were finally able to look at one of these beautiful creatures. It's probably out there with a few of its mates right now, but they also don't allow themselves to be seen. We only know they exist because there's a few tracks and scents. With yet another frog, we have the horned marsupial frog. They're out and about in Ecuador, in the Chaco Forest to be more specific. They're called this way because of their distinctive horns directly on top of their eyes. You know the pouch kangaroos use to carry their offspring? Well, the female horned marsupial frog also has that, except it's on the back, so it acts as sort of a backpack. They develop their embryos there, and when they're ready to come out, they hatch as complete infants, unlike regular frogs where they start out as tadpoles. One more toad, the starry night toad or harlequin toad. They're black and covered with loads of white spots all over them. 
Lost for 30 years, it was discovered back in 2019. Picture them as big bodyguards, water bodyguards to be exact. Oh, that's a very big toad on your screen. Well, for the Arawako people, that's exactly what they are, guardians of water. They also have their own name for them, Guna. Sounds like a cheese. When scientists found them yet again, they came across 30 of these little creatures. But initially, they were expecting only one. Well, what a nice surprise. Here's a tiger for you, although it doesn't quite look like your typical tiger. It's called the Tasmanian tiger, and it seemingly disappeared since 1936. But then, out of nowhere, people started seeing them out there in the wild just five years ago in 2016. They sort of resemble dogs more than tigers, or a fox maybe. Just take a look at its muzzle. Maybe even a mix of both. Then, a few others started popping up too. And if you happen to think you're seeing one right in front of you, but you're not quite sure, check if they've got stripes on their back. They're definitely out there, but still technically marked as extinct by the IUCN. Okay, picture a horse that looks straight out of a movie scene. Tiny, gorgeous fur, very well behaved. It's tiny, but it's not a pony. It's a Caspian horse. They have an interesting backstory to them. They were discovered by Louise Leyland, who got married to an aristocrat in 1957. Having moved to Tehran, Iran, she didn't quite like how the horses behaved there, so she took matters into her own hands. She took a few people with her, and off they went to the Caspian Sea Mountain. And in there, they found three of these beautiful tiny little horses. Now well, that's how the story goes. Coming up next, a possum that was found in an unexpected place. Guess where? You have three options to pick from. Hiding in a ski resort, in the Australian outback, or in someone's apartment in the bathroom. Which one do you choose? You have three seconds. The right answer is a ski resort. Yes, this possum is called the mountain pygmy possum, and it's originating from Australia. So far, there are three different living populations of this tiny possum, but it was believed to be extinct until just 1966. There are fewer than 100 of them, so the IUCN has marked them as critically endangered. Also from Australia is the night parrot, an absolute delight to bird watchers. Very beautiful, yet mysterious. These little fellas live in very remote areas. You can probably count on the fingers of your hand how many times these birds have been seen since they were found again in 1979. That's how rare they are. Have you ever seen a pygmy tarsier? Neither have I. It was only in 2008 that three of them were caught. Scientists don't really want to lose track of their movements again. So what they did was gift them with tiny little collars. This way they can live their life as happy as ever and will know they're safe. The last one I want to tell you about is the tree lobster. But as the name might mistakenly tell you, they're not really lobsters. They're just big black bugs with huge legs. Their extinction story is a sad one. In 1920, a cargo ship got stuck on Lord Howe Island, and it had rats aboard. These rats fled the ship and ran straight to land. Even though tree lobsters are bigger than most insects, they're still relatively small compared to rats. The poor things never stood a chance. Still, in 2004, life shone again for these distinct critters. A pair of Australian scientists were out and about on the island and came across 24 of them. All of them were living beneath one single shrub. Hey, if there's enough space for everyone, it's not small, it's cozy. Bottom line, it's better to be distinct than extinct. Don't you agree? Hmm, looking for something slimy? Well, many people tend to believe that snails are just slugs with shells. But even though they look so similar, they're completely different species. Slugs don't need any protective shells, as all their internal organs are, well, internal, inside their slimy bodies. They can squish themselves and get into hard-to-reach places. Which is why slugs can often be found in the most unlikely spaces, like under tree bark 
or inside tiny crevices, or at the library pretending to study for exams. Snails, on the other hand, are tightly connected with their shells and can't survive without one. Unlike hermit crabs, which replace their shells as they grow, snails are born with a shell on their back. Baby snails look adorable with those fragile translucent bubbles that calcify and become bigger and tougher with age. Cute? Well, you be the judge. Many of the snail's internal organs are inside the shell too, meaning that if it gets crushed or damaged, well, the animal would probably not survive. Still, a snail can repair small scratches and cracks in the shell with the help of proteins and calcium secreted by its mantle. Now, turtles are very close to snails in this regard, by the way, because contrary to common myth, they can't leave their shell at a whim either. A turtle's shell is an integral part of its body, and despite the reptile being able to hide its head and paws inside to protect itself from predators, its skeleton is fused with the hard shell. And just like any other animal skeleton, it grows with the turtle itself. Now, koalas do only eat eucalyptus leaves, but there are over 600 different kinds of those. And koalas only munch on 30, or just 5% of what's available on the menu. So it has to be a very specific eucalyptus tree to make a good meal for a picky koala. These adorable creatures also have something in common with domestic cats. They sleep for 18 to 20 hours a day. Polar bears aren't at all white. Their skin is black under the fur. They need the white color to disguise themselves while on the hunt. The color black absorbs the sun better than any other, while white fur doesn't stop sunlight. Rays pass right through it. In a sense, a polar bear has transparent fur. There's a myth that dogs and cats see the world in black and white. In reality, they just can't distinguish some colors. Nobody knows how exactly dogs see. Some think they only distinguish two colors. Could be blue and yellow, for all we know. But they can see shades of other colors better than people. And cats have wonderful night vision. They need about seven times less light than a human to see in the dark. Now, giraffes were thought to be mute, but recently it's been found that they make low-frequency sounds at night to communicate with each other. During the day, they don't say a word and warn each other of danger in a very unusual way by moving their well-developed eyebrows. It's likely that at night, it's difficult to see the eyebrows, so they start talking for real. While we're on the topic of giraffes, these animals sleep much more than 30 minutes a day, but probably not as much as you do. Their sleeping pattern is quite typical. After researchers monitored a herd of giraffes, they found out they slept at night and took short naps in the afternoon. In total, each giraffe had around 5 hours of sleep every day. Oh, and by the way, a herd of these guys is actually known as a tower of giraffes. Makes sense with the long necks. Seagulls can drink seawater. There are salt-secreting glands near their eyes. These glands purify seawater very quickly, and the salty residue comes out through the nostrils. Yep, you guessed it, salty snot. The Adelie penguins are real romantics. They only have one partner for life. The male must give a smooth stone to the female to create a family. You could say that's kind of an engagement ring. Like humans, though, a female penguin may refuse and not accept the ring. Hmm. Speaking of animal love, foxes are romantic too. Male foxes are good fathers and husbands. They're devoted to their loved ones for life. They look after the females and even pick fleas from their fur. Ah. Male foxes improve their whole houses and take an active part in their baby's upbringing. Dolphins can sleep with one eye closed and the other one open. Half of the brain dreams and rests, and the second half closely monitors the environment for signs of danger. The perfect brain for sleeping during boring classes and meetings. Hey, I didn't say that. Besides, dolphins manually control their breathing. They can simply drown if their whole brain is sleeping. Sea otters are the cutest sleepers among all animals. In the summer, because of the heat, sea otters spend all the time in water. They swim on their backs and sleep in that position. The babies are sleeping on their mother's stomach, and two adults hold each other by the paws so that they're not carried apart by water currents. Ostriches don't stick their heads in the sand when threatened. In fact, these guys don't bury their heads at all. This myth has spread thanks to that famous idiom to hide one's head in the sand. 
In real life, ostriches have to dig holes in the sand for their eggs because they're flightless birds. To make sure they're evenly heated, ostriches put their heads in there to rotate the eggs from time to time. But ostriches still have some escaping mentality. When they face some threat, they can flop to the sand and stay perfectly still, pretending they aren't alive. Now, according to a popular misbelief, sharks can breathe only while moving because swimming helps them push water over their gills. Although many kinds of sharks are designed this way, many others, like bottom-dwelling nurse sharks, don't need swimming to pump oxygen-rich water over their gills. Meanwhile, all sharks do lack swim bladders, so if they stop swimming, they'll probably sink to the bottom. But luckily, a shark's body can't be compressed. That's why rapid descents or ascents are safe for them. Scientists from Japan played audio recordings for cats to prove they're truly dismissive. In those recordings, the owners of the cats called them by their names. Cats' pupils dilated, the animals moved their tails, legs, or ears. Cats heard people, but rarely responded. It's all about evolution. Cats came to people because they were attracted by mice that ate grains. They lived close to people, but were never tame. And yet, we keep feeding them. Birds are actually the only surviving dinosaurs. They evolved from theropods, the dinosaurs that ran on two legs. Yep, T. rex is a distant relative of chickens, ostriches, and even hummingbirds. In reality, flamingos are white. The bird turns pink due to beta-carotene. This pigment is found in the algae and the shrimp that it feeds on. You can change your color too. If you eat a lot of carrots, your skin will turn slightly orange. This will happen because of the high beta-carotene content in the vegetable. Sailors from all over the world talked about the giant squid they met on their voyages. For many years, scientists considered monsters with long tentacles to be a myth. But in 2004, the first photo of a giant squid was taken. They actually exist. Scientists have registered an animal that has grown to 43 feet. Mosquitoes actually bite some people more than others. The most delicious humans are those with type O blood. Also, these insects have really good eyesight. They're attracted by green, black, and red colors. So check the color of your clothes before you go camping. You can actually put a shark in a trance for 15 minutes. To do this, you need to stroke the nose of a dangerous animal with your hand. This sort of hypnosis is called tonic immobility that happens thanks to the receptors in the shark's nose. When stroked, the receptors send a lot of signals and the shark's brain is unable to process them all. Now, what it doesn't say here is exactly how you get close enough to a shark to rub its nose. I'd say that's important information, don't you think? Elephants aren't afraid of mice per se, but these massive animals have bad vision. They also move fairly slowly. That's why they can get startled by a bird or a small creature, like a mouse darting past them. Just the element of surprise, nothing more. The chameleon can change its color, but this creature doesn't do it to camouflage itself. The color change helps the animal regulate its temperature and communicate with peers. Now, when most dogs pant, their tongues hang out of their mouths. That's why many people think that's how they sweat. In reality, dog sweat glands are located on their paw pads. Plus, there are other sweat glands all over their bodies. Dogs pant to evaporate moisture from their nasal passages, tongues, and the lining of their lungs. This also helps to cool them down. You might leave wasps alone, but don't be so sure they'll do the same. Bees do respect human boundaries, and if you don't bother them, they won't hurt you. But wasps are so bad-tempered, they can sting you even if you're just walking by their nest. Well, phooey on them! Looks like a normal garden, right? Zoom in just a little. More. A little more. Okay, pan to the right. Now you're right. Bingo! What's that you're looking at? A stick? Wait a minute. Ah, there it is! Now that's what I call camouflage. The mantis is a beast in the insect world. Its preferred menu? Other insects. And birds. And frogs. Even mice. These mini machines come in many sizes and colors and are found in almost every corner of the world. Most of them are green or brown to blend in with their surroundings. But others like to put on something flashy and are always dressed for the occasion. 
These powerful insects are a farmer's best friend. They chomp up all the vermin and parasites, leaving the fields nice and clean. Ah, good old mantises! And look at that! It's making its way to another branch. Its large front legs act as a grappler and hook to latch onto anything that strikes its fancy. Those legs have sharp spikes on them, and getting caught in that grip would be the last place you'd want to be. And its back legs are powerful enough to lunge itself at anything tasty. There's no chance for escape. And besides looking mean, they're fast, like blink of an eye fast. They catch their daily meal without even breaking a sweat. Pretty flashy. And they don't like to waste time. Mm. They start eating their lunch while it's still alive and kicking. Mm. But enough about the mantis. Let's go down to ground level. Ooh, check out that snake in the grass. Cunning little thing. It's a small snake, only about a foot long, and it doesn't eat anything outside its strict diet. It feasts on little insects, birds, and mice. It slithers its way onto the tree, not knowing the mantis is there waiting, disguised as a twig. The mantis sees everything. It's able to turn its triangular head a full 180 degrees to get the perfect view. It has two compound eyes and three other simple eyes squeezed in between. Definitely not afraid of a little eye contact. The snake slides its way up the tree trunk and inches its way closer to the mantis. They lock eyes. The snake launches itself and bites into the mantis's leg. The mantis slips and falls down the tree. Just in time, it manages to reach out and hang onto a small tree branch and regain its balance. It sinks into its signature fighting stance. Woo, that was quick. No preparation, no warm-up, nothing. The snake slithers its way down, and once again, they're face to face. They stare at each other. Who's gonna make the first move? A mantis usually lifts its arms in the air and expands its back wings to make it look larger when it's getting threatened. Ah, remember the Karate Kid? Yeah, just like that. But not today. It's confident enough against this puny grass snake. The snake, meanwhile, doesn't know what to expect. It's never faced such an alien-like creature before. It's like a stick, but also looks delicious. Ah, confusing. After a second, the snake makes another lunge. It opens its jaws and tries to bite the mantis, but it misses. The mantis dodges easily and grabs hold of the snake's neck. It tries to take a bite, but the snake wiggles free in spite of the mantis's sharp spikes on its legs. The snake's free, but the damage is done. Those spikes penetrated the snake's thick skin. One point for Team Mantis, but the snake isn't quitting anytime soon. It surprises the mantis with a sneak move and catches it off guard. But the mantis manages to do a little hop, a little jump, and grapples the snake to the ground. And this particular mantis is snake-size hungry. TKO, if you know what I mean. The snake never had a chance. But it might not end so quickly if the mantis was facing a hornet. Now we're talking. A flying beast with a beefy stinger versus a quick-footed, clawed fighting machine. Okay, we got time. Let's do it. The mantis stands guard, motionless. It turns its head around, and all five eyes scan the sky, the ground, watching, waiting. So far, nothing. The ground is clear, and the sky is a spotless blue. Then, a quick shadow-like movement flashes across the sky. The mantis couldn't get a good look at it. Another swoosh and a flash of color, this time from behind. Something's toying with the mantis, trying to weaken it psychologically. But the insect holds its ground. A true mantis doesn't flinch. This time, the hornet flies right past it. Those buzzing wings make a sound like a mini helicopter. The mantis is prepared and double-checks its equipment. It looks down at its front legs to make sure they're ready for anything. It's a game of patience. Who's going to show weakness first? The hornet swoops down and tries to sting the mantis. But the mantis is fast. Fast enough to move out of the way, but not quite fast enough to grab hold of the flying beast. It'll have to wait for the hornet to come around again. Then it'll be ready. The mantis needs to time this thing just right. If it can get the perfect angle, it can grab hold of the hornet and wrestle it down. But the hornet is too clever. It keeps coming in at different speeds and angles. 
The mantis is used to ambushing its opponent, so just waiting around to be stung isn't its favorite activity. But it's quick enough to ward off any attacks. Another flash, and the hornet surprises the mantis from behind. It knocks it down. The hornet almost engages its stinger, but just misses. The mantis sees its chance. It gets back up. But one of its back legs is damaged. This could be a huge advantage for the hornet, since the mantis needs both back legs to lunge and pounce. It wobbles around a bit, trying not to appear weak. Speed and counterattacks aren't an option anymore for the mantis. But at least the hornet isn't as quick as a snake. Even without its back legs, the mantis is still powerful. The hornet comes in from another direction and tries to sting the mantis. But the mantis shifts position and manages to escape. But as hard as it tries, it just can't grab hold of the hornet. The hornet flies up higher than ever and uses gravity to build up some serious speed. It misses again, but the impact of the diving hornet damages the mantis's other leg. It can't move. It looks like it's all over. There's no way for the mantis to escape. The hornet decides to go in for one final sting. But this time, the mantis actually grabs hold of the hornet. Without the use of its hind legs, the mantis can't seem to pin it down properly. The hornet manages to hover a little, straining to fly away to safety. The mantis's weight pulls it back down. The more they wrestle, the more the mantis's spiky front legs start to dominate. They grip the hornet tighter and tighter, digging their spikes in deeper and deeper. The mantis sees this as an opportunity to start biting the hornet. But the hornet also has powerful jaws and bites back. Meanwhile, a small little housefly watches in the background, frozen in fear. Shoo, fly! You shouldn't be here! It's dangerous! Buzz off! The scuffle breaks apart as the hornet is somehow able to escape the mantis's grip and crawl away. Crawl, not fly. The mantis was able to damage the hornet's wings. The mantis digs deep and finds a hidden energy reserve. It crawls up to the hornet and manages to grab it again, this time from behind. This way, the hornet won't be able to sting the mantis or even bite it. The hornet can see what's about to happen, and it's helpless. The mantis's claws are locked in way too tight. The mantis begins biting. It may have a smaller jaw than the average hornet, but it's quick and just as powerful. I wouldn't want to be on the other end of those jaws. The hornet tries everything, crawling, flying, jumping off the branch, but nothing works. It succumbs to the mantis's claws and its never-ending appetite. Another stunning victory for the amazing mantis. Now aren't you glad middle school wasn't like this? Uh, chew? What? You want me to chew? (laughs) No problem. I mean, after all, I have molars. I can masticate with the best of them. Oh, I get it. Chew. You're sneezing. Humans do it all. Sneeze, chew. You know who can only do one of those things? Snakes. And if you guess that the thing snakes can't do is sneeze, sorry. They can't chew, but snakes can sneeze. Yes, beware the sneezing snake. Even though they don't seem to have noses, snakes do have nostrils. However, they only use their nostrils for breathing. Snakes do their smelling with their tongue and a thing called the Jacobson's organ, which is located above their mouth, kind of between the nostril and the eye. The snake picks up hints of whatever there is to be smelled on its tongue and then passes them back to the Jacobson's organ for decoding. To give you an idea of how well this thing works, Consider how different nature's best smellers, dogs, are from snakes. Canines are friendly, furry, and warm-blooded. Serpents? Hmm, Not so much. But these two do share the Jacobson's organ. Sneezing is another thing both dogs and snakes do. And we'll get to snake sneezes soon. But for now, I hope you never find a snake in your boots. Unlike a dog, the snake won't chew up your shoes. Because while snakes can bite, they don't have molars, so they don't chew. Instead, snakes swallow their prey whole, even when the thing they're eating is bigger than their mouths. How do they even fit it in? Well, instead of bringing their top and bottom teeth together to grind their prey up into little pieces, snakes unhinge their jaws and bring their teeth apart. The jaw remains connected by muscle and tissue, but once unhinged, 
it can open as wide as 150 degrees. That's almost a flat line. Snakes wiggle their unhinged jaw all around and under their prey. If that won't work, they twist and flip their heads over, then wiggle the loose jaw over the top of their prey. Naturally, the meal tries to object because, well, it doesn't fancy being this snake's dinner. But the snake is prepared. It uses its fangs not to chew the prey, but to inject it with a venom that either numbs the critter or has a calming effect, allowing it to go down easy. Once our snake swallows whatever its unlucky dinner is, it typically takes about 4 days to digest it. If you happen to visit with a snake during this time, you'll notice an obvious lump in its otherwise tube-like body. But don't tell him he's looking a little rounder in the midsection. You might hurt his feelings. Maybe you've wondered why, with something so big in their mouths and throats, snakes don't choke. You know as well as I do that you can't breathe and swallow at the same time, right? Otherwise, your macaroni just went down the wrong tube and you go into a watery-eyed fit of coughing. Well, snakes have evolved with a perfect solution to this dilemma. They have an opening in the bottom of their mouth, right behind their tongue, called a glottis. When necessary, or for a rad party trick, the snake can push its trachea, that's its windpipe, out through the glottis and breathe through it like a snorkel. This way, it can still breathe while its prey obstructs its mouth. (laughs) Talk about multitasking! But can the snake dance while it does all that? Eh, Maybe if there's a snake charmer nearby. By the way, how do snakes hear the music and how does it transfix them? Even without rabbit ears or antenna, snakes hear just fine. They have a good inner ear. But they're not responding to the hypnotic rhythm of a snake charmer's song. It's the swing. No, not the popular jazz form, though that's nice. I mean the motion. When the snake charmer weaves back and forth, the snake mistakes his pipe for a fellow serpent, a potentially aggressive one. It responds defensively by mimicking the pipe's movement. Knowing that snakes hear, it's natural to presume that they talk to each other. After all, we often catch them whispering. (laughs) But remember, it's bad manners to tell secrets, and excellent manners are part of a snake's charm. Unlike a whisper, that famous hiss is meant to be heard. It's a warning, one you should heed. But careful where you put your feet. Make sure that hissing snake isn't protecting a nest. If you accidentally stomp on her eggs, well, you better move fast. Speaking of fast, a shoe! Did you know that we sneeze as fast as 100 miles per hour? That means our sneezes travel way faster than the fastest snake, the black mamba, which clocks in at 12 miles per hour. Might not sound that speedy. I mean, it's slow for a car, right? But think of how small snakes are next to people. Then compare the black mamba speed to that of Usain Bolt. Widely considered the world's fastest human, Bolt set records by running 27.8 miles per hour, a little over twice the mamba speed. And the mamba does it without feet. Snakes are famous for their hypnotic gaze. But snakes don't blink because they don't have eyelids. So how do they protect those mesmerizing peepers? The same way they protect the rest of their body with scales. These transparent or see-through eyeball scales are called brill. In some ways, brill is even better than an eyelid. It shields and protects the eye while never interfering with sight. Cool! Snakes can climb trees, but they can't climb glaciers because they don't like the cold. Plus, the ice is slippery. And while snakes might cling to warmer climates, I'm sure you know that they do let go of their skin. Salamanders do it too, as well as crabs, lobsters, and scorpions. I've never seen a lobster belt or scorpion shoes, but snakeskin accessories are a thing. Before you wear something made of snakeskin, double-check that the snake is done with it. Then again, if you can get a live snake to hold up your pants, you'd make fashion history! (laughs) However, even those who want a smaller waist should watch out for the boa constrictors. Incidentally, we humans shed our skin too, just a bit at a time. Human skin is a prime ingredient in house dust and dandruff. Two heads are better than one when conducting research, but not on the same snake. The condition of having two heads is called polycephaly. 
Though rare, snakes are more prone to it than most animals. And apparently, it's double trouble. Whether food collides in single-throat traffic jams, the body doesn't know which head to follow, or the two can't decide on weekend plans, snakes with polycephaly have trouble in the wild. If you see a two-headed snake, don't think twice before saying hi twice. And if the double-headed serpent sneezes, make that two gesundheits as well. And if that sneezing double-headed snake is your pet, first of all, wow, where did you get one of those? Also, it's probably time to take him to the vet. For snakes, sneezing is often a sign of respiratory infection, especially if he sneezes a lot. When else should your snake see a vet? Well, anytime he's acting sluggish or lazy. Behind the brill, a healthy snake will be clear-eyed. Also, his tongue should dart frequently. Yes, absolutely, snakes sneeze. They clear their sinuses and mouths of debris by exhaling rapid, vigorous bursts of air. Some people think it's not a real sneeze because it's not exactly like our sneeze. Sounds a little species-centric to me, and sneeze is the term veterinarians use, so I'm sticking to it. Uh Uh-oh, you're having a bad day. Those two red dots on your ankle look really bad, buddy. Looks like you've been bitten by a snake. You have no idea if it was venomous or not, so here's what might happen next. If it wasn't venomous, consider yourself lucky. You're probably gonna be fine. Still, any snake's fangs carry thousands of bacteria on them, and when they penetrate the skin, these little pests get into your blood to wreak havoc inside your body. The most terrifying of them cause tetanus, a severe condition that's incurable if you don't get medical help in advance. Worse still, you might be that unfortunate person to have an allergy to snake saliva. Like the bees or peanuts. Oh yeah, peanuts can be shady. When enzymes in the saliva mix with your blood, your body starts trying to get rid of them. It doesn't realize it's basically fighting itself, so the conflict quickly escalates and you begin feeling nauseous and weak. Eventually, it becomes hard to breathe, and you may even faint. So, even if you've been bitten by a non-venomous snake, call for help pronto. Then, there's a worse scenario. The snake was indeed venomous. Every snake species has its own kind of venom that acts differently from others. Let's see. Ah, it can affect either heart and nerves, muscles, or blood vessels. It always starts with a sharp pain at the place of bite. The snake opened its mouth wide, punctured your flesh with its two upper fangs, and injected its venom through the channels inside them. The venom goes straight into your bloodstream, and that's when the real black magic begins. If the bite marks are clearly seen on the smooth skin, and there's nothing else, it might have been a crate. If the bite starts swelling, it was probably a cobra. You start feeling dizzy, hot, and sweating right away. But that's not venom yet, it's you. You're scared of seeing those bite marks, and the hormones adrenaline and cortisol rush from your adrenal glands into your blood to make you blush and tremble. Your heart's beating faster now, Uh uh-oh, helping the venom spread more rapidly. Soon, you'll start feeling stomach pain and cramps. The toxic enzymes in the snake's venom are reacting with your blood, getting to internal organs and muscles. They're all close to each other, so the toxic stuff hits them quickly and aggressively. And when the venom has gone through your liver, kidneys, and heart, which takes about 15 minutes, it spreads to the nerve endings. It's at this point you begin losing touch with reality. Literally! At first, your eyelids will become increasingly heavy. Eyelid muscles are some of the smallest in the body and have few nerves, which makes them an easy target for venom. Then the toxins go on and on through your circulation, filling your smaller blood vessels like a sponge. And as they do, nerves stop functioning from your head down because they're controlled by the brain. It's just getting worse, isn't it? From your eyes, the numbness spreads across your face. Your lips and cheeks become tight, making you look as if you're annoyed with something. Within an hour or two, you will lose the ability to speak and see. The nerves in your face will have turned off completely. But the effects of the bite will go further down, short-circuiting your tongue, lower jaw, neck, diaphragm. Oh boy. When this happens, unfortunately, you're almost beyond rescue. 
if the diaphragm stops responding, your lungs can't function properly and you stop breathing. And we really shouldn't do that. If you're lucky enough, though, the bite could be light, and then the numbness will not affect your vital systems. It'll still spread from the head down your whole body, but won't be able to get deep inside, going through your top layer, so to say. You might lose feelings in your fingers and toes, your skin, and even be unable to move properly. But if you can see and breathe, the symptoms might go away by themselves in a few days. Don't bet on that, though, and call the ambulance as soon as you realize something's wrong. Finally, all this may be completely irrelevant to you, because what you feel is not numbness, it's heartache. Both cobras and elapids have a type of venom that goes straight for your heart. When it gets there, and that's pretty soon, it might make the main muscle of your body beat faster or slower, as well as causing irregular beating. This is a huge strain on your heart. You know what to do. Other muscles can also be affected, especially by sea snake venom. It has special toxins that target muscles, and as your eyes get heavy, you might also feel cramps, first in your stomach and then rapidly spreading to your arms, legs, and chest. You will have trouble moving because your muscles will grow stiff, and touching anything will become an ordeal because of the tenderness. In the end, the venom may make you lie in bed and wait until it goes away. If it goes away. Boy, let's just pile on, shall we? Now, if you look at the bite mark and see it swelling, and there's blood from the two punctures, it means you've been bitten by a viper. This venom acts differently and is even more terrifying. Oh gee. Its molecules are larger and can spread so quickly in the bloodstream. That's why they head for your lymph nodes and act from there. As a result, the venom is slow and painful. At first, you will only feel scared and dizzy because of that. Then, after 15 minutes, the venom will start spreading through your body, beginning from where the viper bit you. The thick and viscous substance will mess with your blood, making it clot and causing bruises. The higher it goes, the more of your body it affects. But this progress is slow compared to the effects of cobra and elapid bites. If you don't get medical help, you will notice the swelling growing every hour. As the venom works its way through your lymph, it will make it go against you, causing even more swelling. Lymph is your body's primary defensive barrier. It's a fluid that contains white blood cells which fight diseases. Venom gets into their ranks and causes disarray. White blood cells attack it to no avail, and it spreads ever further. And when the vile thing reaches lymph nodes, they swell, desperately trying to get rid of the intruder. Production of lymph increases, and the bitten part of your body gets more swollen by the hour. Depending on the potency and amount of venom, your limb will grow twice in size by day two or three from that bite. Since we're talking about your ankle, it's your whole leg that will get afflicted, foot to hip. You won't be able to walk, of course, and sitting will also be off limits. The only hope at this stage is to lie in bed and try not to move. Even this late, there's still a chance your body will cure itself. But if there's any possibility to get you to the hospital, what do you think? Yeah, you should still do it. What the heck? When bitten by a snake, you might panic and do it all wrong. So increase your chances of survival by calming yourself down. Fear will make your heart beat faster, pumping blood through your body and with that, the venom. It still needs time to reach your circulation, so stay calm and lie down, keeping the bitten limb below your heart. Gravity will do the job then. Don't ever try to suck the venom out of the wound. It spreads too rapidly for you to help yourself. You won't even get a drop of it out this way, but only increase your heart rate again by straining. Put away that knife and never try to cut the bite to let out the venom. Like I said, it's already in your blood, and you can make matters worse by cutting. If you didn't have infection inside the wound, you might get it from that knife. Applying cold won't help either. Cold restricts normal blood flow, making venom stay where it is and doing more damage to a single place. Venom might also make tissues more vulnerable to frostbite. You could end up losing a limb. Same goes for tight bandages and tourniquets. When blood flows freely, it lets the venom spread, of course, but also dilutes it, making the substance less potent. The bite might not be as dangerous as you think, 
but by applying a tight bandage, you can triple its power. Hey look, you made it! You're in the good place! Wait a minute. Uh Uh-oh. Never mind. Back in 2009, people in Ishikawa, Japan, saw a kind of rain no one's ever seen before. It was raining tadpoles. First reason is that the wind that day was so strong, it lifted and carried all those tadpoles away in no time. The second possible reason is that big birds, such as gulls, just dropped them while they were flying to their nests. Some scientists believe these creatures were hauled off the ground by a water spout and rained down later. By the way, that day, people found not only tadpoles, but also frogs and fish instead of puddles. And yep, it can be raining worms, too. Some people claim they've seen snake rains. Yay! It was a lovely spring in 1876 in Bath County, Kentucky. Mrs. Crouch was making soap in the yard of her house when she suddenly noticed it started raining meat. It wasn't ground meat. Those were large, 3 inches in diameter chunks of meat falling right on her. Two volunteers were brave enough to try that grizzly-looking meat of unknown origin, and they said it tasted like lamb or deer. Well, they were no foodies. It turned out to be beef. Such cases were registered in Europe, too, and the only logical explanation of meat showers is that buzzards flying over just drop meat pieces they save for lunch. With no luggage, their bodies are lighter and they can fly easier. Wow, I wish it rained donuts on me once. Rains aren't unusual for Oakville, Washington, but this one still doesn't have any solid explanation. Instead of common raindrops, people watch translucent jelly-like blobs falling down from the skies. These little things covered about 20 square miles. Those who got really close to that sort of rain said they felt bad the next day. Scientists studied those blobs and realized they contained human white blood cells. But other tests later showed it wasn't true. Some people think these might have been evaporated jellyfish, which resulted in rain, or it could simply be some waste from a commercial plane. Almost the same thing happened in 2012 in Dorset, UK. During a hailstorm, people found gelatin balls together with hailstones. Researchers collected these goopy balls and stored them in a fridge to study later. Turns out it wasn't necessary since the slimy blobs didn't melt at room temperature. No one is sure even now about where the balls came from, but the first idea was that those were eggs of some aquatic animal carried by birds right up in the sky. Later tests proved that the jelly substance was a chemical that acts as a water lock and is used in many commercial products, even cables to protect them from water. Australian spiders are notorious, and to frighten people, they even learn how to rain. Spider rains are a pretty common thing for Australia because of ballooning. They climb up trees, then spin strands of silk, and that's why the wind can carry them away. Usually people don't notice it, but when it's wet, hundreds of spiders climb up to more desirable places. People say that when it rains or snows, it's possible to see spiders literally drift down on those webs as if they were balloons. If you ever travel to the Mekong Delta, you'll probably have a chance to see glowing balls rising up from the water and beelining straight into the air. The locals call these the Naga Fireballs. Sizes may vary, so these reddish balls can be as tiny as a cherry and as large as a watermelon. During the night, you can see dozens and sometimes even thousands of fireballs. Scientists don't have any solid explanation why it happens, but it's probably flammable gas released by the marshy environment. Still, a local superstition claims it's all because of a giant serpent living in the Mekong. Tornadic water spout is a tornado that doesn't occur on land, but on water. The speed of the tornado can be really high. The water is collected and partially pulled up. It manages to pull fish and even turtles up into the air. Actually, raining fish can also be explained by this weather phenomenon. The same might happen on the snow, too, but it's really rare. There are only six pictures of snow spouts, four of which were taken in Ontario. This weather phenomenon requires that the water is warm enough to produce fog while the air temperature is really cold, next to impossible. Lava is red, sky is blue, I'm on bright side, and so are you. Okay, I made that up. But the part about the lava being red can change. That's true, especially if you see the lava flowing from Kauai Jen Volcano located in Indonesia. It has a typical red color during the day, but at night, it turns luminescent blue. No mystery behind it, just tons of sulfuric acid. This volcano also has the largest acidic crater lake in the world. The water there is so turquoise, you want to jump in immediately. 
But you probably already guessed that you should never ever do that. The fire on that volcano is also blue, and it's the largest blue fire in the world rising up to 16 feet. In some places, water may look like glass. White salt ponds might look like windows or even portals to the world underneath. They have their look because of salt evaporation, and such lakes can be found in France and India. But the Cargill salt ponds in the San Francisco Bay Area look even crazier because of vibrant colors. The shades vary. It can be deep blue, grass green, orange, crimson, vermilion, and even magenta. The color difference is all about the different levels of salinity and tiny microorganisms living in those ponds. On the shore of the Baltic Sea in Kaliningrad District, Russia, there's an enigmatic national park called Dancing Forest. The pine trees are all crooked and twisted there. The forest didn't appear until the early 60s, when the pines were planted to make the dune sand in that area a bit more stable. It's probably the unstable sand that made those trees twist that way. Another reason why those trees are so crooked might be strong winds. Some people claim it has something to do with supernatural powers. They say this forest is a place where positive and negative energies meet. Locals believe if someone climbs through one of the rings in those trees, it'll add an extra year to this person's life. The throbbing hum in Taos, New Mexico has driven locals crazy since the 1990s. Low-frequency hum doesn't let you sleep normally. Even though scientists tried so hard to find the source of the hum, they failed. They blamed it on mechanical devices and even animals. The West Seattle hum, for example, was related to toadfish. Different variations of hum were also heard in the UK, Australia, and in some areas of the United States. Luckily, only about 2% of the world's population can hear it. Noctilescent clouds, or simply night clouds, are so rare because 1. They only form in summer, and 2. They can only be seen at latitudes between 50 and 70 degrees both north and south. To see those clouds, the sun should be already below the horizon, but the clouds still have to be in sunlight. It's possible for the highest clouds in the atmosphere, which are located about 50 miles up. We can't see them during the day because they're too faint. Fairy rings, also known as elf rings or pixie rings, are the enigmatic rings of mushrooms that appear in grasslands and forested areas. Scientists can't explain why these fungi can form nearly perfect circles. But the superstition claims that fairy dances would burn the ground, causing mushrooms rapid growth. In fact, it's partially true. The mushrooms grow in places where a grass withered. The Amazon River, one of the longest on our planet, stretches for 4,000 miles which is more than a drive from Vienna to New Delhi. But there's one river in South America that beats the Amazon River twice. First, it's wider. Second, nobody ever saw it. It's an Amazon underwater twin called the Hamza River, and it runs 2.5 miles underneath. Scientists found it 10 years ago, back in 2011. Don't blink, or you'll miss this rarest weather phenomenon. Red sprites are electrical discharges in the sky that look a bit like an aurora. It's super powerful, about 10 times stronger than any regular lightning, but it lasts just a couple of seconds. They were first photographed in 1989, and there are still very few photos and video recordings of this lightning. To make a video that can clearly show red sprites, it should be at about 7,000 frames per second. Well, I'm out. Living at depths of up to 5,000 feet, The hagfish is one of the strangest creatures in the ocean. And there's plenty on the list. The goblin shark, sea spiders, red-lipped batfish, and even people swimming during winter. Ah, It's freezing, man! Get out! Although it looks like an eel, this fish belongs to the agnatha species. That's fish without jaws. And the family also includes lampreys. Terrifying monsters with disc-shaped suction cup mouths filled with spiraling rows of teeth. Hmm. Hagfish have two tongues, four hearts, and no eyes or stomach. Like something from another planet. And what sets them apart from anything on this planet is that they have a skull but no spine. They don't have bones either. That unique spineless skull is made entirely out of cartilage. The same stuff in your ears and nose. That's right. Scaleless with skin that seems to fit over them like an oversized holiday sweater. It'd be a mistake to think this frail little creature would be an easy dinner. They've evolved to escape from other fish like Houdinis of the deep. And the trick is slime. Lots of it. When something tries to gobble them up or gets just too close for comfort, 
hagfish release a protein from the holes lining their sides. When this stuff meets the surrounding water, it balloons dramatically, as in 10,000 times. The more water touches it, the bigger this goo ball gets. A teaspoon of hagfish slime can turn into a bucketful in a second. It instantly clogs the gills of any fish trying to chomp down on our slimy friend, even sharks. But hagfish have gills too. So why doesn't the slime block their own? Easy peasy. This hagfish will simply tie itself into a knot and scrape the slime off its body. Doesn't mean their slime comes without inconveniences. Sometimes it gets in the hagfish's tiny nose. To get rid of it, they make themselves sneeze, sort of. Gesundheit! This fish's homemade goo is made of flexible strands that are surprisingly strong, as in stronger than nylon. Imagine falling into a pool of the stuff. You'd struggle to move your arms and legs to swim. It might feel like rubber bands tying you up. But you'd be perfectly safe as long as the stuff doesn't get in your nose or throat. In that case, you'd be as unfortunate as those gilled creatures trying to bite into the slimy fish. And hey, Our own species is eyeballing it for loads of potential uses. From parachutes to cars and even clothing. Forget about diving in a pool of this goo. You could be wearing a slime suit in the future. But when it comes to landish creatures, the platypus is just as weird. This mammal has a duck bill, a beaver tail, webbed feet, and lays eggs. Like a lot of fish, the platypus and its relative, the echidna, have no stomach, but they don't need one. They store their food in their cheeks until they surface. Once they've eaten, the food goes straight to their gut. Just when the platypus couldn't get any stranger, they also sweat milk for their platypops. When winter has put bears, bats, snakes, and even myself into hibernation, there's one animal that does things a little differently. During the cold season, the wood frog lets itself freeze, sometimes for up to 7 months. Like a brown popsicle, they fill their body with a syrupy, unnatural antifreeze to stop crystals from forming. And when the right time comes, they can just thaw themselves out, even multiple times a season. These frogs will find a nice covered area in the forest and wait until spring comes. Once they're thawed, they'll hop away like nothing happened at all. When your name's the boxer crab, you have to live up to it. Ding ding! Round one! This little crab is super smart. It has sea anemones living in its claws, and these DIY boxing gloves pack a punch. Carrying around these little tentacled sea creatures helps this tiny crab defend itself against fish and anything bigger than it. When feeling disturbed, the crab starts swinging, and its gloves start stinging. The tentacles of sea anemones are covered in stinging cells that help the animal capture its lunch. Yep, that's no plant, it's a hungry beast! It's a win-win relationship. For helping the crab protect itself, the gloves get a fun ride around the ocean floor and free meals. Its other names don't sound as tough, but I assure you, the pom-pom or cheerleader crab looks cute but shouldn't be messed with. If you're afraid of spider webs, This is one to avoid. Darwin's bark spider is an orb weaver type that creates a jaw-droppingly large web for a penny-sized spidey. The silk in its web is 10 times stronger than Kevlar and double the strength of any other spiders on the planet. And the webs themselves can be as big as a king-sized bed. Not that you'd want to sleep in one. Their web bridges are even more impressive. They can be over 80 feet long. The spiders build them across rivers to catch bugs flying over the water. Or you, rafting down the rapids. Watch out! And here I thought I spent too much time on the web. Gone to the beach on a hot sunny day when you realize you're out of sunblock. Hey, just do what hippos do. When they sweat, they create their own sunscreen. Living in the water for most of its life, a hippo's skin must stay wet to keep hydrated. When they do have to venture out of the water, something strange happens. The red or pink color we sometimes see on hippos are little beads of fluid that absorb the sun's UV and protect the skin from burning. They're also highly acidic to help stop bacteria growing on the skin. Hippos might look big and clumsy, 
but they could easily outrun and outswim the best Olympic athletes out there. Must be why the ancient Greeks called them hippopotamus, the river horse. Now, when you're a plant, it's hard to defend yourself. But not for the acacia tree. It has built-in bodyguards, ants. When a few of the leaves are getting nibbled on, the vibrations alert the ant brigade to head out and stop the trespasser. Living in the hollow thorns of the branches, the acacia ants come out and shock the hungry animal with their wasp-like stinger. The tree is so grateful to the ants that it feeds them yummy nectar. Not only do the ants stop animals from grazing too much, they also help improve the tree's health by reducing the bacteria that would be on the leaves. Now, never heard of a sea squirt? I don't recommend getting too close unless you want water in your face. The sea squirt may look like an underwater plant, but it's an animal more closely related to us than a cockroach. These squishy little creatures are in an umbrella category with vertebrates, like you, me, and anyone or anything else with a fancy backbone. That big, happy family is called the chordates. Starting as little tadpole-like larvae, sea squirts wiggle around in the ocean for a short time until they find a nice bit of water to call their own. Since they're unable to feed themselves, drastic measures must be taken. And I mean drastic. Like oysters, barnacles, and mussels, the sea squirt has a glue-like substance that cements it to the first place it lands. Once they've picked their forever home, they need to start eating. The first thing to go is their own tail. Then they absorb their gills and even their brain. No longer need the ability to navigate the ocean, it's become unnecessary. They're not heartless, though. The sea squirt's ticker is very similar to a human's. It even looks a little like ours. Now, here's one you won't forget. Lobsters, crayfish, and crabs have teeth in their stomachs. After they gulp something down, the food in their stomach gets ground up by large teeth. This is called gastric milling, and it helps the crustaceans digest it easier. One species of crab had to take it a step further, of course. The ghost crab uses these teeth not only for eating, but also to growl. By grinding their tummy teeth when scared or struggling with another crab, they're warning to get away. Well, when you don't have vocal cords, stomach growling will have to do. They're also the fastest type of crab on the planet. They can move 100 body lengths per second. That'd be like you running one and a half football fields in the blink of an eye. Whoa, look at that! So you're swimming two miles down at the bottom of the ocean. Don't ask me how, just play along. It's cold and the pressure is intense. No fish in sight. Then you notice a green, shiny thing. It's a cookie-cutter shark. Its neck glows in the dark to attract fish and other delicious treats. The shark doesn't look like much. It's small, about the size of a cat. It has brown skin and large green eyes. But looks can be deceiving. Every night, this creature rises to the surface and goes after great white sharks, whales, even swordfish. If you look closely, you'll see a round mouth with a bunch of sharp teeth in it. They don't just bite, they work kind of like a saw. This one's called a cookie-cutter shark because when it sees something delicious, it takes a cookie-shaped bite out of it. These sharks have even been known to disable submarines. Wonder what flavor they are. Our next shark is about the length of a car. Only about a hundred of these sharks have ever been seen, but if you met one, you'd never forget it. It has a big mouth, a huge mouth, a mega mouth, like me! It's the mega mouth shark. You could easily fit in it if you curled yourself up. They're not dangerous, though. Well, not to humans. They feed by swimming around with their mouths open, filtering out plankton and other underwater goodies. The shark has special organs in its mouth that glow, attracting little crustaceans. It swims deep in the ocean in total darkness. Probably has a great smile, though. Thresher sharks also have a huge body part, the tail. It's almost half the length of the shark itself, and it looks like a helicopter blade. It's one of the few animals that hunts using its tail. The shark sneaks up on a school of fish and starts to shake its moneymaker. This freaks out some of the fish, which is exactly the plan. In a pinch, it can also use its tail to defend itself. The best thing about this shark? It doesn't attack people. 
The angel shark. There are quite a few types of angel shark out there, but they're more shark than angel. They're flat like stingrays, and their skin is covered with patterns that help them blend in with the seafloor. Because of this disguise, divers sometimes accidentally touch them, which isn't the best idea. They're fast and have powerful jaws. Still, they prefer the taste of small fish to you. The horn shark has two ridges that look like horns right above its eyes. It's definitely the grandpa of the shark world. Not aggressive, swims pretty slowly, and is up late almost every night. Its two favorite meals, sea urchins and crustaceans. It moves its fin on the seafloor almost as if it had paws. But don't underestimate this guy. It has one of the strongest bites of any shark. It needs those strong teeth to crush the shells of its late-night meals. And if something tries to attack it, watch out! Horn sharks have sharp spikes on their fins. The award for the ugliest shark goes to the goblin shark, and it's not even close. From the outside, it already looks kind of weird and is about the size of a pink underwater motorbike. It has a long tail and a seriously long nose. It lives way down in the depths of the ocean and loves to eat squid. It's not as fast as its relatives, but it's way more sneaky. It has a secret squid-catching technique which is totally wild. The shark swims behind the squid. It's catching up, getting closer and closer. But the squid isn't slowing down, no way! It looks like the poor goblin shark won't have any lunch today. Then it opens its mouth. Its jaw is attached to folds of skin that mean it can literally throw its jaw out of its mouth. And it's a shark, so those teeth are sharp. That extra reach helps it grab its lunch, and when the meal's over, it pops its jaw back in its mouth. These sharks have been seen many times off the coast of Japan. They're actually named after the goblins in Japanese myths and fairy tales. There's only one thing out there cooler than a ninja shark. It's the ninja lantern shark. Imagine there's a tube you can slide down that takes you to the bottom of the ocean. It's too dark, you can't see anything. Suddenly, a glowing dot, moving around in the distance. It's coming closer, shooting towards you. It's a blue glowing head. Worse, it looks like this head doesn't have a body attached to it. The ninja lantern shark has black skin, so it's almost invisible in the dark. It's only the size of a human arm, but its small, sharp teeth are no joke. No one really knows why this shark glows. Maybe to attract tasty fish? Another theory out there is that it uses this light to communicate with its friends. It has friends? The hammerhead shark. These ferocious sharks can weigh up to half a ton. They live in tropical waters all over the world, and they're one of the most recognizable sharks out there. Their eyes really are located on the sides of their hammerhead. This means they can see in almost all directions. They even have special neck muscles to lift their head up and down just to see that little bit better. Their favorite food? Stingrays. You know, those flat things that swim along the seafloor, camouflage to look like sand and bits of rock. Stingrays get by by blending in with their surroundings. Danger mostly just swims by. But the hammerhead's eyes see everything. Uh Uh-oh. Great white sharks, hammerheads, and other large sharks live for about 25 years. But one shark can live much, much longer. The Greenland shark can live anywhere from 300 to 500 years. It lives mostly in the North Atlantic and Arctic oceans. It loves to swim deep down where it's dark, so it uses its nose to sniff out food. Since it spends so much time down there, it's figured out how to withstand the strong pressure. It's one of the oldest living, largest, and slowest fish on Earth. Just imagine, you're on an Arctic cruise, and you see one of these sharks moving slowly through the freezing cold water. It might be 400 years older than you. Most sharks are omnivorous. They can go after dolphins, other sharks, crabs, sea urchins, smaller or even larger fish, hot dogs. Eh, kidding about the hot dogs. But the bonnethead shark is a bit different. It eats algae for about half its meals. It's actually related to the hammerhead shark, but its head looks more like a shovel. Can you dig it? If you see this guy swimming around, 
you might think it's a sea snake or a huge water worm. Frilled sharks like to swim way down at the bottom of the ocean, like a lot of sharks. When they're chasing something delicious, they move kind of like a snake. And just like a snake, they like to gulp down their lunch all in one piece. But that doesn't mean they don't have teeth. They have about 200 nice and sharp ones. The saw shark has a long, flat, and seriously spiky nose. Those teeth on its nose never stop growing. Each tooth is equipped with electric receptors to help the saw shark feel around for nearby fish, like a ship's radar. When dinner's nearby, the shark swims up and strikes with its nose, waving it around like a knight showing off his skills. Meanwhile, you won't have time to blink if this guy floats past. Did you see it? How about now? Meet the fastest shark in the world, the short fin mako shark. It can swim up to 35 miles per hour. That doesn't seem that quick on land, but underwater, that's fast. Slower than a cheetah, but faster than most dogs. It's warm-blooded, which is super rare for a shark. That helps it swim to cold and distant places where an ordinary shark simply wouldn't survive. The swordfish goes much faster. It can swim up to 60 miles per hour. It's not a shark, but it's still an amazing creature. In a race, the swordfish will usually come out on top. But it's not just fast, it's ingeniously fast. It has a gland next to its nose that pumps out a special oil. This oil spreads through its nose and comes out through tiny holes. This special oil is waterproof, which lets the swordfish glide through the water at high speed. The sight of its fin in the water nearly stops your heart. It's the reason you feel so uneasy going for a swim at the beach. That massive, razor-toothed hunter that's made its name known, the Great White Shark. So, if the ultimate terror of the sea is leaving the area, it must be for a good reason. But what could possibly scare the Great White away? A giant Lovecraftian monster that makes even Megalodon look tiny? Nah, not even close. Nothing can clear a portion of the ocean as quickly as orcas can. When their powerful pods come looking for food like seals and squids, even the biggest, scariest sharks leave the area without looking back. It's not known if these whales specifically target great whites, or they're just keeping the competition out of the area. But what marine experts do know is that sharks flee, sometimes not even coming back until the following year. Yeah, it makes sense. Orcas are much larger than great whites in size. They have plenty of teeth, and they'll use them to satisfy their merciless desire for meat. Orcas are also highly intelligent and will work as a team to get what they want. Whether that's catching a school of fish, getting seals off the ice, or even chasing down humpback whales. So, if the great white shark itself is scared of the mighty orca, should you be? Well, me personally, I keep my distance from any wild animal. But maybe this will help you sleep better at night. Orcas are known to be picky eaters. Good news for you, human isn't on the menu. They aren't likely to change their diet just because you're in the water today. Oh, by the way, orcas aren't even whales. They're technically the largest species of dolphin. And sharks are also afraid of their relative, the bottlenose dolphin. Even a single bottlenose is too powerful for a shark, but they're tougher when they travel as a pod. Sharks are easily outmaneuvered by the highly agile marine mammals. They use that blunt snout like a battering ram. This basically annoys the shark so much that it just leaves the area. Now, if you think about other top hunters in the animal kingdom, wolves always come to mind. Packs can take over vast territories. And since they're at the top of the food chain, they get to pick and choose from a large menu with anything they please. They're highly intelligent, fast, and agile. But probably their biggest advantage? Numbers. If grizzlies or mountain lions try taking advantage of them, the numbers game always works in the wolf's favor, leading to the hunter becoming the hunted. Even without numbers, they dominate and terrify. It's too hard for any other animal to target a lone wolf, so even they are usually left alone. 
Imagine being able to pounce a wild boar in below freezing temperatures while dressed in orange against a completely snow-covered white environment. Siberian tigers are clearly not playing around. Over 10 feet long and weighing up to 400 pounds, they're the largest of all wild cats. This kitty could easily jump right over your head while carrying double its body weight. The only animal that can really challenge this king of the forest is a large enough brown bear, and it'd be a close call. No wonder the Siberian tiger is the top of the food chain in its part of the globe. As for the top boss in the waters of South America, that would be the green anaconda. Not even jaguars and caiman are safe around the biggest snake in the world. The murky waters of riverbanks camouflage the giant snake perfectly. They go unnoticed, sitting there waiting for something to come have a drink. And then, whoosh, the snake strikes. It uses its sharp curved teeth and 15 feet of pure muscle to hold its lunch in place. Luckily for most animals, after eating their fill, anacondas can go weeks or even months without worrying about their next meal. But the world's biggest snake isn't the most dangerous. That title belongs to the black mamba. Lions, spotted hyenas, giraffes, and even elephants will avoid the mamba at all costs. They all know one bite can stop them very quickly. Growing up to 14 feet, it's the second longest venomous snake in the world after the king cobra. The African black mamba does hold the top spot as the world's fastest snake. It slithers along going 12 miles per hour. That's about where most treadmills max out. Not top dog, but worth a mention, is the green anaconda's neighbor, the electric eel. Very few animals are willing to take on such a highly charged creature. Electric eels have around 6,000 special cells that can produce up to 800 volts of electricity. That's more than six times the standard U.S. wall socket. That's enough to knock a horse off its feet and to power holiday lights. In 2019, a Tennessee aquarium hooked some tree lights up to their eel tank. Every time the eel shot the water, the trees lit up. Now, it's been said that the electric eel can recycle its volts in a process called revolting. Nah, I made that up. One more truthful eel fact to knock you off your feet. Electric eels are air breathers. They have to surface about every 10 minutes to fill their mouth with air. Yep, their single lung is in their mouth. Does the king of the jungle reign unchallenged? In books and movies, sure. In real life, eh, not so much. For one, their home is on the African plains, not the jungle. A whole assortment of contenders, like hyenas, leopards, and crocodiles, are always trying to take the king's crown. Even zebras and giraffes can stop the big cats with a quick kick if they're cornered. If we go by bite force, the African Nile crocodile has the biggest that humanity has ever measured. Its jaws are five times more powerful than that of a lion's. Now earlier, with the water critters, all you had to do was avoid the water. Good luck avoiding a lion! They can run 50 miles per hour, jump the length of a school bus, and climb trees. The lion's biggest challenger for the apex role is the African wild dog. These two are constantly going at it because they hunt for the same food in the same area. Where there's a big pride of lions, the dogs have no choice but to flee. But they've got one thing against the cats. Endurance. Lions might reach incredible speeds, but that's only in short bursts. It takes too much energy to carry 400-plus pounds of muscle over long distances while going as fast as you can. African wild dogs, though, have long, slender legs and big lungs for their body size. Meaning, they can run fast and keep it up for miles. That's how they hunt. Their lunch just gets tired of running. There's one animal brave enough to take on the king if the cat gets too curious. The hippo. They may seem cute and squishy. But hippos are one of the most dangerous animals on the planet. Based on statistics, you should fear them way more than great white sharks. And there's nothing squishy about them. Hippos are pure muscle and weigh as much as a car. Their pointy canine teeth can grow longer than your forearm. These guys aren't afraid of anything. 
even lions and crocodiles prefer to keep their distance. Their name means water horse. And they do spend up to 16 hours a day submerged. Funny thing is, hippos can't really swim. If you see one swimming, it's actually pushing itself off the lake or river bottom. It can still be even the best Olympic swimmer speed, so watch out! Yep, move aside, Leo! Hippos are the true apex animal of Africa. But I wouldn't get close enough to give them the award. As for the ruler of the forest, make way for the grizzly bear. Weighing over half a ton, you'd be mistaken thinking these large fluff balls are slow and bumbly. Being able to maintain a speed of 25 miles per hour for long stretches is too easy for the behemoth brown bear. Uphill, downhill, and on every terrain, they're the off-road SUV of the animal world. Without having any natural enemies, this bear is at the top of its local food chain. Good thing they sleep for a third of the year. Just hope you don't run into a grizzly, um, ever. But especially right before it's about to go into hibernation. They spend the autumn months fattening up for winter. And they're even hungrier than usual. Now, being the largest bird of prey in North America, it's no wonder the golden eagle is found all over the continent in woodlands and mountain ranges. Their wingspan is nearly 8 feet. And they don't call it eagle vision for nothing. These birds can spot a rabbit from 3 miles up in the air. It'd be like you seeing an ant while standing on top of a 10-story building. Golden eagles can also make quick dives from a great height. During these dives, they can reach speeds up to 200 miles per hour, as fast as a flying arrow. 450 million years ago, no, I wasn't around then, the sea level was higher, coral reefs started to form, the climate on our planet was stable and warm, not even dinosaurs were around yet. The time when bony and jawed fish we know as sharks appeared. They've been dominating the oceans and making other marine creatures flee in fear ever since. Many of them, like great white sharks, have evolved and adjusted to life in the open ocean as hunters with a pretty high position in the food chain. They're less diverse today than before. One of the reasons is the asteroid strike from the age of dinosaurs. After it reduced the number of shark species, only smaller and deep-water kinds that ate primarily fish survived. They started getting bigger over time. Near the surface, sharks such as makos or great white ones develop faster movements and are somewhat between gray and blue to blend in with their surroundings. The epaulet shark can even walk on the land. It can't take a walk on the beach because it can't breathe outside of the water, but it lives on coral flats in shallow tropical waters, so it can walk in kind of a crawling motion. But deep down below, there are mysterious alien-looking, often huge shark species that didn't come to the surface, which is why they didn't need to adjust to the new environment and different conditions. They haven't changed a lot through time, so they're some living fossils. These creatures mostly don't have five gill slits, the most common number, but six or seven. It's because there's less oxygen the deeper you go in the ocean, so they need more gill slits. Sharks on the surface evolved to have fewer gill slits. Six-gill sharks are the most primitive sharks we have today. Their skeletons are like those of ancient extinct sharks, and they can survive only in very deep waters. Like cats, sharks have a layer of reflective cells placed inside their eyes, which helps them see better in the dark deep sea or cloudy waters. Sharks on the surface have big eyes because they evolved to hunt in the sunlight, so they tend to rely on their vision. Those that live in shallow waters have small eyes, so they can protect themselves from the sand. Like some other deep-sea creatures, six-gill sharks also have bigger eyes to take in as much light as possible. They have more light-sensing rods, but don't distinguish colors that well. In the ocean's twilight zone, with the minimum of sunlight, there's a couple of bioluminescent shark species. They don't take in light within their eyes, but produce or re-emit it with their bodies. Their skin or organs have specialized cells that produce a soft blue-green light. Deep-sea creatures that produce their own light do that to attract their prey, deter animals from going after them, or, scientists think, communicate with each other. It can even help them to camouflage. They do it by hiding their silhouettes from animals going after them. 
they produce enough light to match their surroundings. The biggest luminous underwater creature is the kite fin shark, found swimming 980 feet below sea level, preying on ground fish or smaller sharks. It can grow almost 6 feet long and lives 3,200 feet below sea level. Deep sea sharks are also bigger than those on the surface. The Greenland shark can grow up to 24 feet long, bigger than a great white. There's a thing called deep sea gigantism. Creatures in nutrient-poor depths of the ocean grow bigger because, that way, they lose less energy as heat. The Greenland shark lives its life in slow motion. It has a slow metabolism and can go very long periods without food. With their slow pace, they evolved to live up to 500 years at depths of 7,200 feet. Sharks in shallow waters catch their prey, relying on agility and speed. But for them, it's easier because there's plenty of food on the surface. Deep sea sharks, with less food and slower life rhythm, had to develop a different style. They're more opportunistic, definitely not picky, and don't care if their future meal is alive or not. Frilled shark Another living fossil from the darkest depths hasn't evolved much through time, and they're one of the last of their kind, with all of their relatives already gone extinct. It grows up to 7 feet long, primarily hunts on squid, and catches other sharks and fish. It looks like a dinosaur, a snake-like face, a long, smooth, thin body that moves in a serpentine way. It can propel itself with the power of its tail and curl like snakes. They don't swim in a straight line like other sharks. Cookie cutter shark grows up to 20 inches. It got the name because of the way it feeds, biting off small pieces. It's a parasite creature, which means it feeds off bigger animals but leaves them alive. They have sharp teeth and sometimes even swallow those that fall off on purpose. Some researchers think it could be because they live in the depths that are nutrient poor. If they swallow the teeth, they could recycle calcium and other material from it. Prickly shark is a rare and unusual creature with many thorn-like denticles and two small dorsal fins. It lives mostly in the depths of the Pacific region up to 1,900 feet. Ghost sharks are not even real sharks, but fish closely related to them and rays. They have big pectoral and pelvic fins two dorsal fins, pretty big eyes, and unlike their cousins, have a single external gill opening. Ghost sharks have slender tails and can grow up to 80 inches, silver to blackish color. They sometimes live in rivers and coastal waters, but also in the depths of the ocean of 8,200 feet or even deeper. They are pretty weak swimmers, so they tend to feed on invertebrates and small fish. Goblin sharks Swimming through the deep sea, this creepy shark with a flabby body suddenly sees a small, innocent squid. It goes toward it, but the potential snack notices it and quickly starts moving to dart away. It seems like the plan could work at first, but then the shark suddenly thrusts the jaw of its mouth and catches the poor little squid in a second. After the meal is finished, the animal simply fits the jaw back into the mouth and goes away as if nothing happened. This is possible because it has a jaw connected to 3-inch long flaps of skin, which is why it can unfold from the snout. It can grow up to 12 feet long with a weight of 460 pounds. Scientists think goblin sharks are mostly active in the morning and evening. The shark has a long, prominent snout and specific sensing organs on it. It uses them to sense electrical fields in the dark oceanic depths. Seven-gill shark is a big cow shark, brown to silver-gray on top, white underneath, black and white spots, with a thick body, a small dorsal fin, and a wide, blunt snout. It can grow up to 10 feet long, mostly lives in the depth of 1,870 feet, but you can also find it in deep channels and bays. It can be aggressive toward humans if provoked, so don't. Like most deep-sea creatures, it's an opportunistic hunter that's not quite picky but likes to go after dolphins, seals, porpoises, and other marine animals. Megamouth sharks mostly live in the depths of 15,000 feet and spend most of their time in the dark, like me. Scientists discovered it in 1976 because it went near the surface at night to feed on zooplankton. That's the only time these sharks go there. During the day, they return to their quiet, dark, and mysterious depths. They are filter feeders, which means they keep their mouths wide open while swimming, so they filter the planktons they like to eat. 
There are organs that produce light inside of their mouths, which attracts potential prey, such as pelagic crustaceans. These sharks live in the deep parts of the ocean, but you can rarely find them below almost 2 miles. Scientists think some other, stronger bony fishes outcompeted them. Deep parts of oceans became oxygenated around 70 million years ago, and sharks have been around way longer. But bony fishes adjusted and adapted efficient ways to use oxygen, while sharks were slow with adaptations, so they lost. Also, oceanic depths are way colder, which is challenging for fish and the rest of cold-blooded animals because the speed of their metabolism widely depends upon the external temperature. The Megalodon was the biggest shark to ever live. Not only that, it's one of the biggest fish and the largest predator in Earth's history. Over three times longer than the biggest great white shark on record, the females have also been found to be twice the size of the males. The Megalodon could swallow a small car without even touching its teeth, if cars had been around then. In fact, the Meg was so big and powerful that it had no natural predators. It was the uncrowned king of the seas, swimming freely from ocean to ocean. This cosmopolitan creature was found all over the world from America to Europe and Australia and Japan, assuming there were countries back then. Meg fossils have been found on every continent except Antarctica. Everybody skips Antarctica. Science tells us that the Megalodon went extinct over 3.6 million years ago. But could they still be alive at the deepest depths of the ocean? The fearsome name, Megalodon, comes from two Greek words. Megas, meaning big, and odont, meaning tooth. Combined, they mean big tooth. And it certainly lived up to its name. Just one of its chompers is the same size as a human head. It had 276 humongous teeth in total across five terrifying rows. In all of history, only a couple of saber-toothed cats and the T-Rex had consistently bigger teeth. Now that's a showdown I'd like to watch. The Megalodon vanished millions of years ago, leaving only huge teeth to be found by modern archaeologists. Only around 80% of the ocean has been explored, so who knows what's lurking at the bottom. If you did manage to make it down, it's unlikely that you'll run into Meg, though. The sharks, like us, preferred warm coastal waters. Deep ocean living would be too cold for the beasts, and food would be scarce. Their entire bodies would also have to evolve to avoid being squished by the enormous water pressure down there. It's unlikely that they're still around, but not impossible. Now, about the appearance of the Megalodon. Scientists believe it didn't look like a great white shark. The Megalodon belongs to a different fish family and most likely looked like a giant sand tiger shark. Flattened snout, small eyes, its dorsal fin moved backward. The sand shark has two dorsal fins about the same size. The coloration is light brown with a white belly. It may have had brown red spots like a sand shark all over its body. We used to think of the Megalodon as something scary from the first finds of its fossils. That was back in the Renaissance era people found some teeth in the rocks. At first, these teeth were thought to be the tongues of dragons or snakes. And here is the first drawing of what the owner of these teeth supposedly looked like. A massive snout with a scary nose and a bunch of razor-sharp teeth. The Megalodon is usually described as a sort of giant great white shark, but this is just a common myth. In fact, the ancestors of today's great white existed at the same time as the Meg, but they weren't the best buddies and were even in competition with each other. The great white shark was a better hunter, using its smaller size and agility to snap up Meg's prey quickly. They were also known to eat Meg pups, who were only half their size. This didn't help the whole extinction thing. We also have evidence that megalodons were brutal hunters, kings of the food chain. The first combat tool in their arsenal was the battering ram, The Megalodon would take its prey by surprise. It had only one chance to hit it. If it missed, it would take too long for a second round. The maneuverability of the Megalodon was comparable to a large truck. While a great white was no match for an adult Meg in a head-to-head -head fight, they sure weren't scared of stealing their food. This only left the bigger fish and whales for the Meg. But its food supplies began to run out as the whales swam to the cooler new seas. 
the whales adapted to prefer the colder temperatures, leaving our friend the Meg behind. The Megalodons either starved or were frozen into extinction by the Ice Age. Rather than a great white, the Megalodon is more like a modern bull shark. It had a short snout, a flat lower jaw, and huge pectoral fins to support its massive weight and size. As scary as they are, these sharks were actually caring family guys. Several Megalodon nursery areas have been discovered in Florida, Maryland, and Panama. They gave birth to their young in shallow water environments. We know this from discovering loads of tiny Megalodon teeth found in these areas. I wonder if they had nannies too. But how come there are so many Megalodon teeth out there for us to analyze? Due to their messy, aggressive eating habits, sharks regularly lose their teeth. They lose a set of teeth every one to two weeks. That's 40,000 teeth in a lifetime. They must rake in a fortune from the tooth fairy. Because of this, their teeth were continually raining down to the ocean floor. Luckily for us, they're also the hardest part of the shark skeleton, which is why so many teeth have survived and become fossilized. It's fair to say the first discoveries of the Meg's teeth confused people. Early discoverers thought that the Meg's teeth were petrified tongues of ancient serpent creatures. They even used to call them tongue stones. It's also a common myth that the Megalodon was around at the same time as the dinosaurs, although this would have been pretty cool. The dinosaurs were wiped out around 66 million years ago, but the Megalodons came much later. The oldest Meg fossil is only around 23 million years old, but it's tricky to pinpoint the exact date. After all, calendars weren't invented yet. They became extinct way before humans even evolved. The earliest Homo sapiens, which is a fancy name for the first humans, emerged about 2.5 million years ago. But what if the Megalodon shark didn't go extinct? Whale populations have dropped drastically since these guys were last around, so there'd be way fewer whales for them to chomp down on. Whales have also gotten a lot smarter and learned new defensive moves, making them way harder to take down. It's estimated that they ate around 12 tons of food each day. The Kraken is a colossal squid, a legendary sea monster, the biggest hunk of calamari you ever saw. And if this monster had existed, the world would have changed beyond recognition. The Kraken has powerful tentacles, solid muscles with suckers at the end. They're impossible to escape. The Kraken can break a ship in half, or just pull it down into the depths. But the worst thing about the Kraken is its size. According to old sailors' stories, its size is almost 10 soccer fields. Hey, maybe the Kraken could play soccer! The Kraken legends said the monster was so giant that sailors mistook it for a small island. In past centuries, it would have been impossible to defeat such a beast. If the Kraken existed in reality, it might have had offspring. Yeah, in all the world's oceans, there would be giant monsters that could sink any ship. It's unlikely that the Kraken would have competitors in its habitat, so its population would grow strongly. Since the Kraken is enormous, it would need a lot of food, so the population of other large sea animals would fall significantly. Blue whales, great white sharks, other giant squids, all the big sea creatures would be endangered. The Kraken belongs to the cephalopod genus. This species includes squid and octopus, some of the most intelligent creatures on the planet. The Kraken is a skilled hunter and will never fight in the open. Colossal squids live in deep waters and they have the largest eyes among all animals. The squid's eye is the size of a dinner plate. Thanks to this, they can see their prey from far away. Similarly, a Kraken would spot the ship much sooner than sonar could pick up the Kraken. It would always have the drop on you. Well, that's not good. In 1857, a squid beak was discovered on the coast of Denmark. Other huge squid remains were found in the Bahamas, and then scientists were convinced that gigantic squids existed. While colossal squid have been officially discovered since then, it's been more than a hundred years and we still don't know what the max size they can grow to. The fact is, colossal squids are one of the most elusive creatures on Earth. They live in the depths of the ocean where it's challenging for scientists to reach. Any dive to a greater depth requires powerful, bulky equipment. Underwater bathyscaphs and cameras make a lot of noise and light, 
which squids notice from afar. They flee before we can see them. It's difficult to say if these huge squids were the size of a small island, but the truth is, we've only studied about 5% of the ocean. It may be that in its depths, monsters much more terrible than the Kraken swim. And they're off. The Nile crocodile easily outswims the hippo. They're swimming upstream against a heavy current. But the croc's body is built for swimming through rough water. It weighs as much as two refrigerator freezers and is thought to be the heaviest reptile on Earth. It can swim up to 22 miles per hour. The hippo can't swim. Not really. It just walks on the bottom of the river and pushes off from any big rock it finds. It can close its nostrils whenever it wants to be able to glide a bit through the water, but it's no match for the croc. The croc reaches the shore and starts running through a field. But better make way. The hippo's catching up. It's speeding across the flat terrain. Even though it's huge, the hippo can outsprint a human. The croc was miles ahead, but the hippo's faster on foot. The hippo breaks through the ribbon. It's all over! Beep, beep! Hey there, Roadrunner! What you running from? Wait, hold everything. That coyote is catching up fast. He's right on your tail. The greater Roadrunner can run up to 20 miles per hour, even faster when it's really hungry. Despite what you see in cartoons, a coyote is actually twice as fast as a Roadrunner. But the cartoon version is way funnier. In lane 1, from the dense jungles of South America, the ever-slow sloth. And right underneath him, in lane 2, we have a typical garden snail. And the race is on for the slowest animal on Earth. With the sloth's top speed clocking in at 0.2 miles per hour, it's no wonder they call it a giant moving pillow. Well, I call them that. The snail is off to a good start. It can cover a small neighborhood in about an hour. This boneless creature has only one foot, which is covered in protective slime. It's too blurry to see, but I think the sloth is still in the same spot. And now it's asleep. It'll probably be asleep through the whole race. A sloth can snooze it up for 15 hours a day. It's asleep for more than half of its life. And look, the snail got out of that sunny patch. Next up, a shady patch. Ooh, it's too close to call. We'll have to wait till the sloth wakes up to get back to this race. A grizzly bear can easily outrun a human. If you're at a picnic and you cook up something a little too yummy, better leave your lunch behind. The fastest a human can sprint is 28 miles per hour, set, of course, by Usain Bolt. So he'd probably be able to run away in time. If you're slower than him, which you are, then you're in trouble. In a one-on-one -on -one sprint between a human and a grizzly bear, you're going to be the bear's lunch every time. But out of all the bears, which one's the fastest? Polar bears, grizzly bears, brown bears, sun bears, and the cute cuddly panda bear. On your marks, get set, go! The tension is palpable. The grizzly and the brown bear are claw to claw. A brown bear can easily run as fast as a grizzly. The sun bear is the smallest bear in the race. It's about 6 feet long, or tall, or whatever. It just can't keep up. The polar bear got off to a great start, but it just doesn't have the speed of the grizzly or brown bear. Grizzly takes the lead. No, it's the brown bear. Now grizzly. Wait, where's panda? What's it doing? I don't think it knows it's a race, but isn't it cute? It just finished its third bamboo stick. A panda bear can eat up to 28 pounds of bamboo a day. That's like a lot. But it's off. It found its shortcut and is rolling down that hill. It zooms past the grizzly and the brown bear. It's all over. Panda wins. Sorry, bears. We all know that the panda isn't exactly fast. It's actually one of the slowest bears. Still, if you see a panda rolling down the hill in your direction, run. A Boeing 747 has a top speed of around 620 miles per hour. The fastest bird is the gray-headed albatross. It can fly up to 80 miles per hour and stay up there for 10 hours without landing. The peregrine falcon is faster, but only when it's diving straight down to grab some takeout. Watch out, pigeon! Wow! Big planes take a long time to get up in the air, but the albatross? It's up and off in a few seconds. It's in the lead! But a few minutes later, 
back to Slowmoville. The sloth's awake. That's good. But so far, it's only managed to lift its arm to reach that tree branch. The garden snail's still trying to get past that big rock. Sloths spend a lot of their time as motionless as possible, so that they don't become someone else's breakfast. Not great training for a race. But hold on! Player 3 has entered the race. It's the Galapagos tortoise. Its powerful front legs carry this tank of an animal. It's a whopping four times faster than a garden snail. This just got interesting. We got ourselves the race that'll last a century. The tortoise is running and dodging every obstacle. Nothing can stop it. Hey, no cheating, sloth. Don't be dropping tree branches from up there. Deep underground, a mole's busy burrowing around. A mole can eat as many earthworms as his own body weight and can dig around 15 feet per hour. The American badger is the fastest digging animal in the world and is surprisingly fast on land. It can almost match the speed of a human on a good day. Head to head, the American badger wins the tunnel race pretty easily. Too bad the mole can't see where it's going. Moles aren't really blind. They just have terrible eyesight and they're colorblind. And they can't wear glasses down there. Ah, the proud cheetah. It's sprinting across the savanna at warp speed. I've been the fastest land mammal for millions of years. I got this. The fastest cheetah on record was a sprinter named Sarah. When she was 11, she ran the 100 meters in under 6 seconds. A cheetah can run up to 80 miles per hour if it sees something tasty. Sarah was raised in an American zoo and was one of the first cheetahs to have a puppy buddy when she was growing up. Alexa and Sarah, friends forever. But soaring above Sarah is a humble little bat. And that bat is making Sarah look slow. The Brazilian free-tailed bat can hit 100 miles per hour. It's the fastest mammal on the planet. Now, time for some shrinking. First of the blocks is the Australian tiger beetle. It charges forward at 6 miles per hour. That may not seem like much, but relative to its size, it's lightning fast. That's like a human running alongside a high-speed train. Running in the inside lane is the Saharan silver ant. Ants are team players and are strongest when they're working together. But even one ant can be amazingly strong. An ant can lift hundreds of times its own weight and can sprint like there's no tomorrow. Hussein Bull can hit four strides per second. This silver ant does 50. Scientists even discovered that these little ants like to gallop once they reach their top speed. Our last contender, the fastest animal on Earth. It's none other than this tiny mite. It's only the size of a sesame seed. If we go by body lengths per second, this microscopic animal outruns everything else on the planet. It's believed to run almost twice as fast as the tiger beetle. And if it were human size, it would run faster than the speed of sound. Um, let's get back to the crawlers. They finish yet? The tortoise is in the lead. The snail finally got past that large rock, and the sloth is on its way to branch number two. The tortoise is three feet away from the finish line. Wow, I just can't take much more of this excitement. But I think I have time for a latte. All right, you're scuba diving in the ocean, watching corals and colorful fish flitting by, when suddenly an enormous shadow appears above you. You look up and see a massive creature approaching you, its mouth a gaping abyss. Relax, just stay still and you'll be fine. This leviathan is a basking shark, one of the scary sea monsters that isn't really capable of doing harm to anyone. Basking sharks are filter feeders, just like baleen whales. They open their large mouths to swallow plankton and don't even have teeth. It's late night in the Central American jungle. You're out in the wild to watch birds, and you hear flapping of wings. Excited, you look intently into your night vision goggles, only to see a face out of your worst nightmares. Ah, don't scream. You'll scare it away. It's a perfectly harmless, wrinkle-faced bat, and it isn't interested in you. These are fruit bats, and wrinkles on their faces allow them to collect fruit pieces and juice for later snacks. By the way, their Latin name, Centurocenex, was given to them for their semblance to 100-year-old humans. 
Walking around a Nepali national park and deciding to wash your face in the river nearby, you freeze in terror. A crocodile is looking straight at you from no more than a few feet's distance. Then it raises its snout above the water and you exhale in relief. It's a gharial. These reptiles have long and narrow snouts that allow them to efficiently catch fish and at the same time prohibiting them from hunting any other prey. While still carnivores, gharials are pretty shy and will slither away at the sight of humans. Right now, there are no more than a thousand of these crocodilians in the whole world, so let it go. Especially if it's a girl gharial. <laughs> you dig your garden in the backyard and notice something moving on your shovel. You take a closer look and drop the tool in horror. A small creature looking like a hostile alien is scurrying away into some burrow in the ground. Eh, no worries. It's just a star-nosed mole. These critters have peculiar snouts that look like they've been blown up from within. Their eyes are small and weak, so the star on their nose helps them a lot to move around and seek food. It's always on the move, touching everything it can reach as if the tendrils were tiny fingers. Oh, you're bathing in the ocean again. Well, look to your right, there's a real tooth shark going right at you. Nah, don't panic. It's just a sand tiger shark. Neither a sand nor a tiger one, it's a vulnerable fish-eating shark that slowly swims in the seas and chases its prey from time to time. There have been no reports of it ever attacking humans. But it still has rows of sharp teeth, so don't try to touch it just in case. It may seem placid, but you don't want it to get a bite out of you, do you? Okay, from ocean to desert, you're in Australia and longing for some water. You see a likely spot and start digging the ground only to stumble upon a creature straight from the depths of neither, all covered in thorns. It eyes you suspiciously and slinks away because it's just a thorny devil. Despite its ominous name, this lizard is harmless to humans. Horn-like bumps on its skin are for protection from predators and birds of prey. The thorns are hard, but as long as you don't touch them, you're fine. Now, if you have arachnophobia, it won't calm you down. But tailless whip scorpions you might meet in North and South America, as well as Asia and Africa, are more afraid of you than you are of them. Eh, tell yourself that. These nightmarish creatures don't have stingers and won't even bite when threatened. The worst they could do, and only if you corner them, why would you do that, is prick you with their front legs, leaving tiny puncture marks on your finger. Many people even keep them as pets, and they're quite affectionate toward their owners. Yeah. If you ever stumble upon a burrow from which a hairless, big-toothed creature is speaking at you, just don't mind it and let it be. Naked mole rats are the sphinx cats among rodents. They're close relatives of mole rats, but, well, naked. And they're fascinating in their own right, too, thanks to living entirely underground. They're almost totally cold-blooded, but can conform to any temperature outside. And their flappy, wrinkled skin doesn't feel any pain at all. So pins and prickles, as well as sharp teeth, don't scare naked mole rats. You're once again lost in the jungle, this time on Madagascar. Poor you. The night has fallen, and you seek shelter. But when you think you've found a suitable tree to build a lean-to, you freeze in terror. A black, long-fingered hand appears on a tree branch right above you, and two huge yellow eyes are staring you down. Then you see a shaggy face and realize it's just a lemur. An eye-eye, more precisely. This creature is native to Madagascar and only goes out at night, so you're lucky to see it. It fulfills a role of a woodpecker in tropical forests. It knocks on tree trunks to find bugs and uses its long, wizened fingers to reach inside. Tired of being scared, you seek your way home, but your horrors aren't over yet. There's a big red and white snake across your path. It hisses and lies in wait for you to move. You know it's a coral snake, a really dangerous, venomous kind. You stop in your tracks, and only when it finally slithers away, you realize it was actually a milk snake. 
They often mimic venomous ones, not only coral snakes, to protect themselves from predators. Still, if you're not a snake expert, it's always best to stay away. Okay, this creature will infest your darkest dreams. A giant African millipede. It's big, it's glossy black, and it has hundreds of tiny crawly legs. And yet, if it had googly eyes, it could even be cute. Perhaps that's why so many people keep them as pets. That and because they commonly live up to 10 years. Giant millipedes can't really bite. Their only defense is curling into a tight ball and secreting irritating liquid from the pores of its skin. If you dare touch it, don't rub your eyes or nose afterwards. It's quite unpleasant. Goliath Bird Eater is another popular pet creepy crawler. It isn't dangerous for humans, despite it looking like your worst nightmare. This is one of the largest spiders in the world, and as its name implies, it sometimes hunts small birds for food. But they aren't part of its regular diet. The spider prefers worms and amphibians. Make sure you don't frighten it, though. It can still bite or release hairs in self-defense. The bite is similar to a wasp sting, and hairs can cause severe irritation on your skin. But mostly, this gentle giant is just shy and will crawl away at the sight of you. Oh dear, there's another snake approaching you, and fast! You're about to turn and run when you see a hulking eight-legged form cutting into the snake's path and leaping on it. It's another arachnid, and it looks even more terrifying than the snake. It's a camel spider. Not really a spider, nor a scorpion. These creatures belong to a separate family. They became the stuff of many urban legends, but in fact, they don't even have any venom. Sure, they can bite, and their jaws are pretty powerful, but camel spiders can't do much more to a human than just bite. They hide in the sand and burrow to leap on unsuspecting lizards, invertebrates, and yes, even snakes. And now, picture a pill bug. Not exactly a beauty, but since it's small, it's okay. But what if it were 10 times as large? No, definitely not okay. Still, such a creature exists, and it's a giant isopod. Thankfully, it lurks in deep, dark, and cold waters, so it won't ever come up in your backyard. Giant isopods grow to such enormous size because of something called deep-sea gigantism. Deep-dwelling creatures have to endure great pressure of water, extreme cold temperatures, and scarce food, so their metabolism slows down. Isopods don't move much, and more often than not, just lie in wait until some poor small bug or crustacean crawls within their reach and they can munch on it. And though it looks like a many-legged chaos from below, a giant isopod can hurt you even if it wanted to. Just pet it already. Well, the seahorse is an unusual fish. Normally, female animals carry a child, but seahorses do it the other way around. For 9 to 45 days, the future father carries the eggs inside a special pouch until the birth process begins. Then the male opens his brood pouch and squeezes out the children. The female anaconda finds the deepest puddle and spends her pregnancy in it. She will starve for about 7 months while pregnant. Then she will give birth to 40 children that make up 30% of her body weight. Her babies are completely independent and will explore the world around them. The Suriname toad looks like a normal toad, but is totally flat. Unlike most animals, this one carries its future children not inside, but on its back. Female toads have special holes on their backs for each egg where the babies develop. After 3-4 to four months, the little Suriname toads wake up and crawl out of the pockets on mom's back. Kangaroos are born just one month after conception, but they're not yet ready for life in the outside world. Newborn kangaroos are smaller than an inch. These tiny creatures crawl into their mom's pouch using their front legs. After 195 days, the kangaroo grows big and strong enough to leave the pouch. Sea urchins lay more than 2 million eggs, but not all survive. Male and female urchins throw something like a cloud into the water, which contains the future offspring. 
In the next few hours, if the egg cloud is not eaten by other sea creatures, the eggs will turn into a ball with microscopic hairs and then form a skeleton. At this point, they're ready for their own reproduction. Most animals either lay eggs or have a live birth. But the Jackson's chameleon does both and gives birth up to 30 young at a time. The female bears the eggs, minus a shell, right inside her body, instead of laying them as many other chameleon species do. In the yellowhead jawfish family, a dadfish takes care of the future offspring. The male broods the eggs inside his mouth. After the birth, the male carries his babies in this safe place. The brooding method lets the father keep his children safe because he can swim away from danger with the babies in his mouth. Sloths spend most of their time on the treetops. Their birth process is extravagant. The female lets her hind legs dangle and clings to a branch only by her front ones and gives birth in this position. The baby sloth grabs the mother's fur right after birth and climbs to her chest. The velvet spider builds a special room for giving birth and childcare. Just like weaving a spider web, she constructs a cocoon around her, where she lays up to 80 eggs. Then she makes a hole in the cocoon so that the offspring can escape. But this hole is too small for her, so she will never come out. For two weeks, she will feed the hatched spiders until they become independent. Whales, the biggest mammals in the animal kingdom, give birth underwater, so their babies have to rise all the way up to the surface to take their first breath. Mom whale will feed the baby with 54% fat milk for the next 4 months until it grows enough to eat on its own. Octopuses give birth only once in a lifetime. One of the arms of the male octopus is adapted to fertilize females. Some octopus separate the arm from their body and give it to the female. After laying eggs, female octopuses circulate water currents over the eggs to clean them and protect them from predators. Now imagine giving birth to a baby the size of a 4-year-old. Poor mom! But that's what kiwi birds do. Their eggs can weigh up to a quarter of their body mass. To produce such a big egg, female kiwis have to eat three times more than usual. Shingleback lizards also have a difficult pregnancy. These animals normally have up to two babies, which doesn't seem so bad. But the babies can make up a third of the mother's weight. That's like a human giving birth to a 7-year-old child. Giraffes are some of the tallest terrestrial animals, which has an effect on the birth process. In a giraffe birth, the baby first pokes out the front hooves, then the nose, and the entire head. Within an hour, the baby is born. Before taking the first breath, the baby giraffe falls from the height of 6.5 feet to the ground. Ow! Hammerhead sharks can give birth without mating with another shark. Basically, they're just making copies of themselves. This was first discovered in 1999 in a Nebraska zoo. There are just a few other animal species, like some geckos and lizards, that can reproduce this way. Porcupines are known for their sharp quills. In the womb, these quills are soft, but right after birth, when coming in contact with air for the first time, they become hard and sharp. Naked mole rats are incredibly reproductive. They live in colonies and have a queen, who is the only female to give birth. First-time moms can have up to 15 babies, but every litter after, the number of babies grows. At her peak, a mole rat queen can have up to 33 babies, which is the largest litter size of any mammal on Earth. Hippopotamus pregnancies last about 8 months, despite the animal's big size. When ready to give birth, hippo moms leave the herd for 2 weeks to establish a strong connection with their babies. Hippo calves are born underwater, so they learn to swim from the very beginning. Zebras have a really hard time after birth, both for mom and the baby. Zebras are an animal who can see a newborn baby as a potential threat in the future. So when a baby zebra comes out, a male zebra can attack it immediately. 
the mother protects her offspring, often not having any time to rest. Elephants have the longest gestation period of all mammals, lasting more than 18 months. Though they live up to 70 years, most elephants won't have more than four babies. When the elephant mom is ready to give birth, other elephants from the herd form a protective circle around her until she delivers the baby. At birth, they can weigh up to 260 pounds. To protect them from predators, barnacle geese lay eggs on a cliff at 400 feet, which is the height of a 36-story building. When the eggs hatch, the little chicks face a problem. There's no food nearby because they're on a rock. So, at just a few days old, they jump off the cliff and try to make a soft landing. Although marine iguanas don't have to leap off a cliff, they're also in a hurry soon after they're born. Female marine iguanas lay eggs in an underground cave that they dig. This is a safe place to hide from predators, but sooner or later, the baby iguanas come out of these caves to eat. And this is the moment when snakes start to hunt them. The fastest and strongest iguanas survive to enjoy the food. Wow, look at this cute little cookie cutter. At first glance, it looks like an oversized anchovy. But in reality, it's an undersized shark. This shark never grows bigger than 18 to 20 inches, but it doesn't make it less dangerous than its peers. They got their sweet cookie name because they have a unique feeding strategy. They bite off small chunks from much larger animals and get away with it. These little guys live deep down in the water column, making them quite mysterious and hard to study. We don't know exactly where they hang out, but they've been spotted all over the world, especially in tropical and temperate areas. The cookie-cutter shark is a total parasite. It feeds off larger animals while keeping them alive. It uses its sharp upper teeth to latch onto the skin of bigger sharks, fish, or even marine mammals. Then, with its strong lower teeth, it scoops out a mouth-sized chunk of flesh or blubber. Ow! So watch out, because even big predators like bluefin tuna, great white sharks, and spinner dolphins can end up with scars from these little sharks. Now, there's one crazy story about a cookie-cutter shark biting a person. Picture this, a long-distance athlete swimming between islands in Hawaii at night, surrounded by boats with bright lights attracting prey. Yep, that swimmer got a nasty bite on the calf leaving a gnarly scar, but luckily, no permanent damage. Lesson learned, don't mess with cookie-cutter sharks during their feeding frenzy. To hunt like this, they have a well-equipped mouth. The mouth itself is like a short line that goes across, surrounded by these big, fleshy lips that can suck stuff up. It's got a bunch of tooth rows in its jaws, like 30 to 37 in the top and 25 to 31 in the bottom, and they increase as it gets bigger. The upper teeth are small and narrow, standing up straight with a single smooth pointy bit. The lower teeth, on the other hand, are way bigger and wider, almost like knives, and they interlock to make a saw-like cutting edge. Just like any other shark, cookie cutters lose their teeth throughout their lives. But here's where they're different – they swallow their lost teeth. Some scientists think they do this because they live in nutrient-poor deep waters and want to recycle important tooth-building materials, like calcium. That's a brand new approach to diet supplements, huh? Since they feed closer to the surface at night and deeper during the day, they're almost always in the dark. So this sneaky little shark has these special light-producing organs called photophores that are strategically placed on its belly. These photophores help it blend in with the light coming from above, kind of like camouflage. It's a classic move in the bioluminescent world. The cookie-cutter shark also has this cool, non-glowing collar around its throat. Some scientists think this collar acts like a fancy lure, making it look like a tasty little fish from below. Imagine how irresistible that would be to a whole gang of hungry sharks. It's like a dinner invitation they can't refuse.